So, if you look at the the title, what does simultaneous mean? Happen at the same time. Happen at the same time. Okay. So, simultaneous equilibria is means more than one equilibrium process happening at the same time. And so, we're going to look at how that influences certain things and how that impacts some things you guys have already done. There's not a lot of math I'm going to make you guys do with this, but understanding the concept is important. Okay. So. Sometimes more one thing going on. That's what simultaneous equilibrium is. To show you guys an example, I'm going to do a demo. This is going to be cool. Here's my test tube. Here I've got some solid silver chloride. Now, what do you guys know about silver chloride? It is an insoluble compound. I'm going to take just a little bit of it here and put it in my test tube. Just a little tiny bit, maybe a little more. I'm going to do all of it. That's good. Okay. Right there. Okay. Hey guys, you know what color silver chloride is? Silver. It's actually not silver, it's white. Okay. So I'm going to project this here. Can you guys see that? Kind of? No. <laughs> yeah, you see that? Sort of. Okay, you can see it's white in coloration, right? Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to this some drops of aqueous potassium iodide. Now, what is the main component of aqueous potassium iodide? Water, right? But also it has some other stuff in it. What are the other things? Potassium ions and iodide ions, right? Drop, 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 drop. Okay. There's no fire involved. Okay, what do you guys see happen? Yellow. Aha. Let me project this for you. I am recording this right now. Ah, no, it sucks with them. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Can you see that? Okay, we'll take a victory lap here around the room. Okay, Zaya, what color is that? It's brownish. It looks like dirty water. Well, okay, if you don't look at that brown, that's a stain in the test tube. How about if you look at it like that? It's yellowish. Kind of yellowish. Okay, now specifically, the solid started as a white color and changed yellow. If you see a color change, what does that imply it took place? A chemical reaction of some kind took place. So something happened here. Anytime you mix two things together and they change color, that's what it indicates. And so we're going to look at what that is. Actually, two things happened. It's kind of beige. It's kind of beige, yeah, I know. Pretty impressive, eh? Yeah. Yeah, woo, yeah, okay. You guys don't look very excited. Oh my gosh, okay. I know, don't worry. We will, we will do something cool, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what you saw happen just now, but you don't realize it. The first reaction was this. When I add the aqueous solution to the silver chloride, the first thing that, you, that occurs is that that insoluble compound, which is silver chloride, will dissociate to a small degree and will to a small degree dissolve in the water, and we get some silver ions, and we get some chloride ions. Now this is very poorly soluble, so which side of the reaction is favored? The left side is reactant favored, and so we could write an equilibrium constant to describe this process, which would be, uh, what kind of equilibrium constant would describe this? Um, that's P. Yeah, P, because we're talking about solubility, right? And the value is, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10th power. So the point of that is this does not happen to a very large extent. However, once this does happen, and once we have silver ions there in the solution that are available to react, these guys, once formed, will react with something else that is present. Okay? In that solution also, we had silver, or not silver ions, we had iodide ions, I minus. And so these guys will react, and they will form silver iodide, which is a solid. Yeehaw. If I look at the overall process, which is the sum of these two equilibria, what do you guys see the same on both sides? AG plus is on both sides. So that would cancel out. And so you've got silver chloride, AGCl, reacts with I minus, and it's an equilibrium 
with AGI and CL minus, okay? That's what we saw. That's the overall reaction you guys saw. So silver chloride reacted with iodide ions to make silver iodide, and that's the yellow solid you guys saw. The proof of that was that that's yellow, of course, and then silver chloride is white, and then chloride ions loose in the solution, okay? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I could also represent uh, or uh, uh, describe this second equation here using an equilibrium constant. What kind of equilibrium constant do you think that would be? KSP. Well, it wouldn't be KSP exactly, right? Because this looks kind of like the reverse of a solubility reaction, right? So it is going to be related to KSP, but how would I find the value of K there? One over KSP for silver iodide. Now, I'm going to tell you guys that for silver iodide, KSP is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the minus 16th power. And so I need you guys to have calculators, because I can't do this in my head. Calculate for me, what is the value of K for this second step? All right, you guys, what you got? Six point seven times ten to the fifteenth power. Yeah. So, guys, for this process, where silver ions and iodide react to form silver iodide, is that product or reaction favored? That is hugely product favored. This is going to proceed almost entirely to completion, like that, right? Okay. Now, here's the thing: when we made this overall reaction down here at the bottom, we did that by taking the sum of these two different steps. So for this overall process here at the bottom, I could calculate an overall equilibrium constant for the total process. And when I do that, I have to use the equilibrium constant from step one and from step two. Okay? And here's the way it works. Do you guys remember? When I add two reactions together, I multiply their equilibrium constants. So the overall equilibrium constant is going to be K1 times K2. This one right here is K1, that's K2. Figure out for me, guys, what would be the overall equilibrium constant? 1,200,000. So 1.2 1. 1. times 10 to the 6th power. Yeah. Yes. That's a spectator. Yeah. This is the net ionic equation. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, is the overall process reacted or product favored? Product. Product. Which is more soluble, silver iodide or silver chloride? Silver chloride is more soluble. Silver iodide is less because when I combine these things, silver iodide replaces silver chloride, right? Or the iodide ion, rather, replaces the chloride. This doesn't dissolve as well. That's why you see that form in the reaction. Okay. Does that idea sort of make sense, what we just did there? Okay, so in this reaction that we saw, we actually are considering both of these reactions together to get this overall process. Now, you can kind of think of the other like way to explain what we saw happen right here, again, okay, why this is a favorable process and why it proceeds in the forward direction, is in this overall, or in, in the, rather the first step here, when silver chloride dissolves and gives it silver ions and chloride, right? These silver ions that are produced here get used up in this second reaction, right? Here they get used up. And so you can kind of think that this silver ion that gets produced here ends up getting consumed in a second step. Or in other words, its concentration is going to be decreased by reaction with iodide. If this concentration gets decreased, what happens to the position of equilibrium? It's a shift right to produce more of this, right? And so that's why the silver chloride here is going to dissolve and get converted is because even though this does not form to a large degree, 
The silver ion, once it does form in the first reaction, it gets used up, and that pulls the position of equilibrium to the right. More of this dissolves. It gets converted to silver iodide, and there we go. Yeah. Okay? So this is just a demo to illustrate what simultaneous equilibria is, but it's also to kind of drive home the point that sometimes you guys have to consider more than one thing that happens at once. And that influences some things that you have done and understanding some things that we're going to talk about that are new. Okay. Let's look at this. You guys have previously, for like several days right now, been calculating solubilities of things using KSP values, right? Do you guys remember, though, that I told you that what you were doing, like in that podcast last Friday, that when you use KSP values to calculate solubility, that what you're doing is approximate? It is not exact. And here's why. When you use equilibrium constants to calculate solubility, or the KSP values to calculate solubility, what you are assuming is that the only thing happening in the solution, the only equilibria, is the dissolving of that solid. So, for example, if we look at lead sulfide, which is PBS, okay, you're assuming that when this dissolves in water, right, that the only thing happening is that dissolves, it makes lead ions, PB2+, and it makes sulfide S2-. And that's the only thing that happens, okay? Now, based on that assumption, we could calculate, using KSP, which is right here, we could calculate the solubility, right? Because for this guy, right, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, and so we'd say S squared is equal to 8.4 times 10 to the minus 28 power, or something like that, and you can solve for S. Why don't you do that for me really fast? What would S be? I'm sending the minus 14th power, molar, okay, oh, okay, well, yeah, I, I, I heard you guys both, yeah, okay, but uh, whatever, so that's the solubility you would calculate from that solubility product constant, right, but like I said, that is not accurate, okay, that's an approximation, because it assumes that that is the only thing that is going on. Oftentimes, there is more than one chemical process going on that will influence the, effect, the amount to which this thing dissolves. In this case, let's think about what these ions do. Does lead ion do anything significant to water? Yeah, I mean, it poisons you, but besides that. Not really. What about sulfide? What does sulfide do? It does. In other words, what is sulfide? What kind of thing? It is a base because it accepts a proton. So, once this guy dissolves, right, and forms lead sulfide, these sulfide ions can then go through and participate in other reactions. Josiah, man, this is entertaining. Sulfide reacts with water, and it's going to produce HS minus and hydroxide, because this is a base, right? Now, here's the thing. Let's think about this in terms of Le Chatelier's principle. If the sulfide ions, once formed, are able to go through the second reaction and react with water and accept the proton and make hydroxide, what is happening to their concentration in the solution? It's decreasing. If these get used up, right, what is that going to do to the position of equilibrium? It's going to shift it right, okay? And so this is going to be more soluble than predicted by its KSP value. And if we wanted to get a more accurate determination, we would have to look at the overall equation for what's going on and the overall equilibrium constant, okay? Now, if we think about that again, so this is step one, this is step two, right? For step one, we said the equilibrium constant's KSP, which is 8.4 times 10 to the minus 28th power, what kind of equilibrium constant would describe the second step? K what? KB, because we're talking about a base. And for this guy, KB, I always have to look it up. It's in my notes here somewhere. Okay. KB for sulfide is 1 times 10 to the positive fifth power, because sulfide is actually a strong base. Okay. And so... This second process has a high tendency to occur, and so when I look at the total equation for the total reaction, what cancels out? 
Sulfide does, right? And so the overall reaction looks like this. PBS plus H2O is in equilibrium with PB2 plus plus HS minus plus hydroxide. And the overall equilibrium constant would be the product of these two things multiplied together. And since that's 1, 8.4 times 1 is 8.4. Negative 28 plus 5 is negative 23. And so my overall K value is 8.4 times 10 to the minus 23rd power. Could I use that equilibrium constant to figure out how much this dissolves? I could. And that would give me a more accurate determination of its solubility. Would it be a different number? Yeah. yeah. By something like, I mean, this, this is different from this by like a factor of about 100,000. You know, that's, that's it. Okay. Yes. Yep. That is okay. Well, now, now just remember, all the SP and the B means, we're just marking them to, to describe what kind of thing it represents. They're just equilibrium constants, right? Yeah. Not that I know of. Yeah. Make sense? Okay. So this is showing you guys why things containing a basic ion will be more soluble in neutral solution. This effect is even more profound if we think about something in acidic solution. If we are in acidic solution, ionic compounds that contain basic ions will be even more soluble than they would be in water. Okay? If you look back here, we showed you guys how the basic ion can react with water, right? And that process is called what? Hydrolysis, right? And so it produces, you know, whatever. And so that gets used, you know, the sulfide gets used up. And so that causes the position of the solubility equilibrium to shift right and causes more lead sulfide dissolved than would otherwise. If you're in acidic condition, that effect is going to be even more intense, okay? Guys, let's think about it, okay? Let's even actually think about that, that one you guys had, the AP question last night. Last night you guys looked at the solubility of magnesium fluoride, right? Okay, well, magnesium fluoride, when that guy dissolves, MgF2, right, that would dissolve and give you magnesium 2 plus, right, and two F minus ions, which is what you don't want in chemistry, okay? Now, those fluoride ions are bases, right? And so the same argument holds for this compound as it did for lead sulfide. If I dissolve this in pure water, the fluoride ions will react with water, and they're going to make hydroxide, and they get used up, and that enhances the solubility of, of magnesium fluoride. But in acidic condition, that's even more pronounced. Okay, If we are in an acidic environment, what does that mean we have a lot of? Hydronium ions, right? And so when you have F-, minus, which you don't want in chemistry, and that reacts with hydronium ions, right? what you're going to form is what? H2O, what else? And then HF, not, not HF minus, but just HF. Okay. Yes. How do you know what's, okay, so that's a good question. So really, it will react with both, right? Fluoride would react, has the opportunity to react with water, has the opportunity to react with hydronium ion, right? But of the two processes, the one that is more favorable is the reaction with hydronium. And so, how do I know that? Because... I'm Mr. Harper, and I know these things, but, okay, so, but, but the other way you know that, right, is because acids and bases react, and those are always product-favored reactions, right? So if you have hydronium around, then it's more favorable for fluoride to react with that as opposed to water. And you're assuming the hydronium is going to be autoized with water? Well, no, I'm saying we're in an acidic environment. So in an acidic environment, we have an excess of hydronium ions beyond that produced by the autoionization of water. Ah, okay, it's a good question. We'll look at that here in just a sec. Okay, so d does that make sense what I'm saying to you guys here? Yeah. Okay, so in an acidic environment, there's excess hydronium, fluoride can react with that, will make water and HF. Okay, now this first step, right, this is the solubility part, right, and so the equilibrium constant is KSP for magnesium fluoride, which is whatever that happens to be, right? For this second step down here, right, if I was looking at the equilibrium constant for this reaction, 
what does this sort of look like right here? It looks like Ka kind of, right? Except this is the reverse. And so the equilibrium constant would be 1 over Ka because this is the reverse reaction. And then we'd have to multiply the whole thing by 2, right? Because there's two fluorides and whatever, and so if I do that, then this would be squared. And anyway, we could go through and figure out equilibrium constants, all that sort of thing. But like I said, I'm not going to make you guys do any math with this sort of thing. I just want you to understand why this is going to be more soluble in an acidic environment. And that goes back to Le Chatelier's principle. In an acidic environment, fluoride is going to react with hydronium. That reaction is going to happen strongly. It's going to be very product favored, which means the fluoride gets used up in that reaction. If this gets used up, that causes this to dissolve more because the position of equilibrium shifts to the right. Does that make sense? Okay, Jackson Baylor. Would he be doing 1 over K A squared just because there are two? Yeah, because you got to have two fluoride here because there's two fluoride up there. Anytime you multiply an equation by a coefficient, you raise the equilibrium constant to that power. So if I multiply this by 2, I would raise the equilibrium constant to the second power. This equilibrium constant would be equal to 1 over Ka for HF, because that's the re reverse reaction, right? Okay. And that's how I would go through and, uh, through and get that. But uh, do I think that's going to be on the AP test? No. Do I think that uh, that's going to be on my test? Probably not. But it just pays to be aware of these sorts of things. You never know when it might be useful. You never know when it might be useful. So, Sabrina, you had a question about what about in basic solution, okay? So, here's the thing, okay? If I think about what's going to happen, like, okay, let's think about magnesium fluoride in pure water, right? Magnesium fluoride in pure water is going to ionize, and it gives me magnesium 2 plus, and it gives me F minus, 2 F minus, right? F minus in pure water will react with water and is going to produce HF and OH minus. And this second step, the equilibrium constant is going to be KB, right? And this is KSP up here, okay? What? Oh, whatever. What, 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 whatever, okay. The problem is I'm talking too fast and getting too excited, okay? So in neutral solution, this second reaction causes fluoride to get used up, right? It's gonna, gonna, and so because this concentration is going to decrease because fluoride reacts with water, that causes the position of equilibrium to shift right somewhat, not necessarily a ton, okay? But the point being that magnesium fluoride is more soluble than you would expect just based on its KSP value, okay? Now, think about if we had a basic solution, like you were saying. In basic solution, you have an excess of hydroxide ions, Right? Excess of hydroxide ions here, right? Just kind of imagine, right? Say we're adding hydroxide, right? Well, added hydroxide causes this second equilibrium to shift left, right? Which causes this to shift left. Because your, your fluorides aren't reacting as much as they would otherwise, and so that shifts this left. So magnesium fluoride containing a basic ion would be less soluble in a basic condition you would expect than it would be in neutral or acidic conditions. Does that idea make sense? Okay. Now, on the AP exam, if you're given a question where it asks you calculate the solubility of blah, 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 you're going to do it just like you've done. You're going to use the KSP value and just figure out, you know, the value of S or X or whatever you want to call it, which is going to give you the molar solubility of the compound. But if they ask you a question like, you know, say like on the homework like last night, say we add another part to the problem because you calculated the solubility for magnesium fluoride, right, or give it, gave it to you. And then, you know, say, if they ask you a question like, why does your calculation of the solubility underestimate the true solubility? Why is it really higher than predicted by KSP? Well, then you'd have to understand that in this reaction, this is a basic ion, so it reacts with water, and so the true amount to which this dissolves is greater than predicted by KSP. Does that generally lightweight make sense? Okay, Mr. Nguyen. Um, what? Oh, so 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 and those problems, it, it tells you the pH of the buffer solution primarily because that tells you either the hydronium or hydroxide concentration, right? And for those compounds, 
That was you were looking at insoluble hydroxides like iron three hydroxide or something like that. The hydroxide is a common ion, and so that affects you know it's the it's the, uh, the common ion effect basically, right? This is a similar idea, but it's not exactly the same mathematically. Okay, so Jack Spiller. Um, in the bottom reaction, uh, why does it the uh, magnesium react with the leftover? Oh, good question. See, there would be another thing that happens, right? But it depends on really like the relative concentrations of things, right? The hydroxide concentration is not going to be super high. You would see some of that happen. You would probably see some amount of magnesium hydroxide form if the concentrations are high enough, right? Because the solution has to become saturated. So if the magnesium ion and hydroxide ion concentrations were high enough, you would see that happen also. Yeah, but see, that's all real complex. We're not going to do that. Well, I mean, to an extent. I mean, really, like, I, I'm just showing you guys so you're aware that multiple things can happen. And so what we're doing really is an approximation. Okay, I want you guys to talk to your partner. I want you guys to answer this question. Of these silver salts, which would you expect to be more soluble in the presence of a strong acid, knowing what you have learned? Talk to your partner. K values are irrelevant. This is qualitative knowledge. A basic anion is a, a negative ion that can behave as a base. So, like fluoride's a basic anion, right? Yeah, man. I can edit this out. They can fast forward through it too. I mean, you know, it's the beauty of having me on video. What? I don't know. You tell me. You tell me, Cyrus. I don't know. Yeah, totally different. Okay, I think you guys got it. AP Chemistry. I'm going to actually go through and have people evaluate these one at a time. So for the first one, Cyrus and Josiah. Would you expect silver chloride to be more soluble in the presence of a strong acid or no? no, no. Why? Less anion. Well, you are correct. The answer is nope. Okay. That does not react with a strong acid. It's not more soluble in strong acid. But the question is why? Michaela Montes and Princess, why is that the fact in the case? What? What about the Cl minus? It is an insignificantly weak base. You guys see how chloride is a negative ion, right? Yeah. So in principle, it could accept the proton. However, chloride is the conjugate base of the strong acid hydrochloric acid. Therefore, this is insignificantly weak and is not going to react with a strong acid. Therefore, because this doesn't react, it doesn't get used up, it does not shift the position of equilibrium, and so this will be just the same solubility in strong acid as it will be in neutral solution. Yeehaw. Menglo and Misanuyan, what do you think about silver phosphate? You think it won't shift? 
You think it will shift? Why? Well, it's not a strong base, but it is a significant base, right? Be, be wary of saying that, guys. Make sure, make sure, please make sure on the AP exam, ladies and gentlemen, make sure on the AP exam, do not call this a strong base. It is not a strong base. Phosphate is not a strong base, but it is a weak base that will significantly affect the pH and will react with a strong acid. So for silver phosphate, right, because when this dissolves, it creates silver and phosphate ions, phosphate will react with a strong acid. Since this will react with an acid, that would get consumed, that would cause the position of equilibrium to shift right, and this will dissolve more in the presence of an acid than it will otherwise. So this one is more soluble in acidic condition than in neutral. How about silver carbonate going backwards? Cameron Gall and Chris Mui, what do you think? No. You think no? Why? Because what? You mean carbonate? Yeah. yeah. It is a weak base. And since it is a weak base, will it react with an acid? No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It will. It will, right? And in fact, you guys should know this from before, right? From last semester. If I react carbonate with an acid, what does it make? H2CO3, carbonic acid, which breaks down to form water and carbon dioxide, right? And so this will react. And this is something that also people get confused a lot of the time. And I'm not picking on you, I'm just saying. Weak bases will react strongly with strong acids. It is very product favored. This reaction is very product favored. So in the presence of an acid, the carbonate is going to react very strongly. And the position of equilibrium is going to lie far to the right. So because this gets used up, that decreases that concentration, that shifts equilibrium to the right, and this will dissolve more in an acid than it will otherwise. Now here is the tough one. Silver, what's that called? Chromate. Not chromate. Dichromate, okay. Aaron King and Kristen Mendoza, the golf buddies. This guy right here, do you think that would be more soluble in an acidic environment or not? Maybe. That's a very definitive answer right there. Why maybe? Robert Emmitan and Kaylee Byers, what do you think? <laughs> Andy Coopy and Eric Wang, what do you think? Why? Flip the coin in a set? Kind of, sort of. Okay, now here's the thing. We've never talked about acid-based properties of a dichromate ion, have we? That's why I put this up here. It's so a throw you for a loop. Say, I don't know. Okay, but here's the thing. This is a negative ion, right? And so this is not the conjugate base of a strong acid, right? At least we don't think so, right? It's not one of the ones we've talked about. And so here's the thing. If you were asked, what do you expect about this? Would it be more soluble in a acidic environment? Well, unless you have some information to the contrary, right? Because it's a negative ion, you might expect that this could possibly react with H plus ions, right? Coming from an acid, right? And if it can possibly react with H plus ions coming from an acid, then this could potentially get used up, which means that could potentially shift the position equilibrium to the right, and that could improve the solubility of that. If you didn't know, then that would be a reasonable default assumption because that's a negative ion, and in principle, any negative ion can, in principle, be a base. Yeah, okay, one more thing. It'll be very fast. Ladies and gentlemen, the last thing we're going to talk about is complex ion formation. <laughs> complex ion formation can also affect the solubility of a compound, okay? Now, you guys are going to want to read about this in your book. It talks about it somewhat at length over the course of a couple pages. Tonight, you guys need to read and do these problems due tomorrow. Okay. So, we're going to think about, we're going to think about the solubility of silver chloride in an aqueous solution to which we have added ammonia of a significant concentration. Now, here's the thing. Silver chloride, though it is poorly soluble, will to a small extent dissolve 
in an aqueous solution. And when it does that, it's going to make some silver ions and some chloride ions. And its equilibrium is described by KSP, right? Now, here's the thing. This is very poorly soluble, right? But anything that happens that reacts, that causes the silver ions or chloride to react and be removed would cause the position of equilibrium to shift right, correct? Okay. So in the presence of ammonia, here's what can happen. Silver is a transition metal ion, right? And in the presence of a ligand, it can form a, a Lewis acid-based complex called a complex ion. How many ligands would you expect this to bind? One. One? Two. Double the charge, right? And so here's what's going to happen. And it happens in steps. Just like when you think about a polyprotic acid loses a proton in steps, right? These react with ligands in steps. So silver ion reacts with an ammonia, right? And it's going to make some of this guy, Ag, NH3, and the whole thing being positively charged. And then once this forms, that can react with a further ammonia ligand, Ag, NH3, this whole thing being plus, reacts with ammonia, NH3, to be in equilibrium with this guy right here, Ag diamine uh, thingy. Okay. And that's positive. And both of these things here have an equilibrium constant. Okay. Now, it turns out that if you look at a, like, silver will form a mixture of complex ions, right? Some will only go that far, some will gain the second ligand. But the point is that each of these has an equilibrium constant. And each of these, when this gains a ligand, that is a product-favored process. So imagine for a second if you have silver ions reacting with ammonia, and that forms the complex ion, right? That reduces the concentration of silver in the solution, right? What does it do to the position of this equilibrium? Shifts it right. And so that increases the solubility of silver chloride. It will dissolve better in the presence of ammonia than it will in just plain old water because they will form a complex ion, and that enhances the solubility of that ionic compound. If you really wanted to know the equilibrium constant, you could calculate it, right? The overall thing would be K1 times K2 times K3, and that gives you the total. But that's the story. Do you understand why this is more soluble in ammonia than it is in water? Okay. That's what I want you guys to know and be able to understand. I'm not going to ask you on the test probably to do a lot of calculations with this, but I am going to ask you probably to explain why this is more soluble in ammonia than in liquid water. Ladies and gentlemen, this stuff is due tomorrow. If you've got questions, talk to me at lunch. Have a nice day. Oh, Harbor, can I get a copy of the Hang on one second. Let me stop the recording.